Hello, everyone. We will get started in just a few minutes. Thanks for coming. All right, it is 1230. So we get started now. And thank you all for attending the uh, week five of the winter quarter quantitative seminar, the 25th annual, uh, the 25th year we're doing this uh, seminar series. Um, and I want to start today before I uh, just want to start with the land acknowledgement here today before I introduce today's speaker. Um, so the University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. So today we're excited to be welcoming uh, Professor Rahel Salman, uh, who's a quantitative ecologist and assistant professor in the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology at uh, University of California, Davis. Um, Dr. Salman's research focuses on the development and application of hierarchical statistical mo models to study wildlife populations and communities, um, especially using uh, non-invasive survey methods such as camera traps um, uh, to study terrestrial mammals with the goal of, to contribute to their management and conservation. Um, Dr. Salman was born in Germany and I was a diploma in biology from the University of Bonn and a PhD from uh, the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research. Um, Dr. Salman has authored 89 peer-reviewed papers, uh, several additional book chapters, and has applied her methods to all sorts of different uh, animal populations, ranging from tons of different sorts of wildcats, jaguars, puma, pumas, leopards, ocelots, Giant armadillo, northern flying squirrels, black bears, uh, Sunda stink badger, which is one that I had to look up, um, and then frogs, short-eared dogs, spotted skunks, etc. And today uh, we'll be hearing about birds and or occupancy modeling with, with birds. Um, so without any further ado, I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Salman. Oh, and if you have any questions, um, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, uh speaker has graciously offered to take questions during the, the talk, but we'll also have a formal Q&A at the end. So without any further ado, take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction, Sean. And um, if you want to look up another wild um, mammal, look up the moon rat. I think it's just as exciting as the Sunda stink badger. Um, thank you all for uh, inviting me to um, present at your seminar and tell you a little bit about um, my work on occupancy modeling and using occupancy modeling to study wildlife communities. And to my own surprise, I'll be talking about, well, mostly models, but applications of these models to birds, even though um, Sean's absolutely right that I do focus on terrestrial mammals. So um, 
quantities such as species distribution, species habitat use, or species richness are really key to um, research in the fields of wildlife ecology, conservation, and management. They inform multiple aspects of these broader fields. And really what these quantities boil down to, they boil down to uh, some really simple questions. So how many species are there and where are they? But these questions are really deceptively simple. Um, and that is because wildlife um, is really difficult to enumerate. It is often rare, um, species live in challenging terrain, they can be really cryptic. I love to illustrate how cryptic wildlife can be with this series of pictures, and I promise you there's a cat in each of these pictures. In case you haven't found it yet, um, here it is. Um, and so um, what this leads to then is that um, our ability to detect wildlife, even if it's present, is typically imperfect. And um, perhaps more um, challenging even is that our ability to detect wildlife also varies. It varies with the method we use, with the species we study, the habitat we're working in. So you can imagine that like trying to find a nocturnal rare carnivore um, by direct observation is really challenging. Um, whereas using some of these more indirect methods like camera trapping can really improve our ability to detect um, these kinds of wildlife species. Um, and um, this, um, a uh, varying and imperfect detection uh, issue um, has really um, uh, spurred the development of a multitude of statistical modeling approaches that estimate different quantities such as populations, occurrence, um, while accounting for imperfect and varying detection. And today I'm just going to focus on one um, of these approaches and that is occupancy modeling. So my talk is structured into three pieces. I'm going to give you a general introduction into occupancy modeling just in case um, some of you aren't familiar with that framework. And then I'm going to talk about two um, case studies where we took that framework and expanded upon it um, to look at specific questions regarding community um, community ecology. Um, okay, so here's my intro to occupancy modeling. I'm going to be talking about occupancy models as a hierarchical model. So a hierarchical statistical model is just a model that has multiple levels where one level is conditional on the other. And in the context of occupancy modeling, that means that we have a statistical model that describes the true ecological state, which in this case is occurrence, a species occurs or it doesn't occur at a particular site. And then conditional on that true ecological state, we formulate a model that describes our observations. In this case, we have species detections, which are also binary. We either detect the species or we don't. And that observation process is conditional on the um, underlying ecological uh, process in the sense that the ecological state dictates what we can observe. So for example, if we have a site where species don't, where a species doesn't occur, then we can only ever uh, not detect the species. Now that's of course, assuming that there are no false positives. There are occupancy models that deal with false positives, but for the purpose of my talk, we're gonna assume there are no false positives. The only false observations we can have are false negatives. So we can have sites where species occur, but we fail to detect it. Um, or of course we can be successful in detecting it. And which one of the two outcomes is more likely is governed by this quantity detection probability. So that a probability of detecting the species if it is truly present. The general setup of uh, occupancy surveys or occupancy data is that we're typically interested in this ecological state of occurrence at a collection of sites. Um, and so at that collection of sites, we um, perform observations. Um, specifically, we collect species level detection, non-detection data over repeat, uh, repeatedly over some number of sampling occasions. So in this example here, we would just have three occasions. And what's really crucial um, is that um, we make the assumption that the ecological state occurrence doesn't change over the course of our repeated visits. And now you can see how that assumption allows us to then actually gain some insight into the probability of detection because at a site where we have seen the species at least once because we assume a population closure, um, we now know that these failures to observe the species are truly just failed detections. We know the species is present. And so that's where the information for estimating detection probability comes from. And that's what allows us to then estimate probability of occurrence corrected for imperfect detection. We can, of course, also formulate these um, models properly in a statistic using statistical formulation where we have um, our um, statistical model that describe our binary observations um, with a success probability being detection probability, which is conditional on the true ecological state. And similarly, we then have our um, model for the ecological state 
um, which is also binary. So we also model that as a Bernoulli random variable where the success probability is the occurrence probability. And both of these probabilities, we can then um, further model as functions of um, covariates on the appropriate on an appropriate scale. I've put the logit scale here. That's probably the most commonly used, but it's definitely not the only one you can use. So that's the basic occupancy framework. And one really important ex, um, uh, extension to that framework is um, that of community occupancy modeling, where instead of analyzing a data set for a single species, we now jointly analyze data from multiple species. And um, we go one step further in that we assume that species level parameters come from a common distribution. So for example, if you think back, uh, we take the occupancy intercept, for example, we now have an occupancy intercept for each species in our joint data set. And we say that these uh, species specific intercepts come from typically, usually a normal distribution, some uh, shared distribution that is governed by what's called hyperparameters. And these hyperparameters are shared by the entire community. So this is what that would look like. If you have a particular parameter on the X axis, you can think about the frequency of a particular parameter value in the community as following you know, the shape of that, of that hyper distribution. Um, and this uh, approach is, constitutes a form of information sharing among species, and that can um, really improve estimates for data sparse species. And of course, it also allows you to make inference on the community and the species level. That's basically really what it boils down to is that you have a species level random effect in the model and you actually care about the um, species level um, estimates. So against that background, the first, uh, a uh, case study that I want to show you is one where we developed, um, we took this community occupancy modeling framework and expanded it to combine it with the Dirichlet process model in order to estimate community structure and species similarities. Um, so the challenges with this community modeling approach that I just showed you are that um, when we consider um, species specific parameters to follow this common um, hyper distribution, um, effects that may be specific to subgroups in our community can be lost. Um, and we, if we want to counter that problem by grouping our community a priori, so you know, instead of considering the whole community, we split it up into smaller groups, um, then the way we choose those groups can actually affect the results, particularly, again, for data sparse species. Um, so um, this question of how to group species um, then in a statistical manner rather than a priori uh, in a fixed manner um, is of course not a new problem. So one approach that people have used is to use finite mixture models where you uh, predetermine some number of groups, K, so a number of groups that make up your entire community. You then um, estimate species group membership in some fashion. Um, and instead of assigning, um, we're estimating a parameter specific to each species, you now estimate a parameter that is specific to a group plus species level group membership. So that approach also has some limitations and mainly um, how do you choose K? Um, of course, um, there are ways to deal with that, um, but rather than, um, rather than having sort of a two-step approach where you pick one K, do the analysis, then maybe pick a different K, do another analysis, you could also choose to do that in one integrated framework by using infinite mixture models. And in an infinite mixture model, you estimate both the number of clusters and uh, in, uh, species group membership. Sorry, I'm going to say cluster and group interchangeably, so please don't let that throw you off. Um, so um, infinite mixture models estimate both the number of groups and um, species group memberships. And as a consequence, any parameter um, we estimate with an infinite mixture model accounts also for this uncertainty in how many clusters there are. One um, such infinite mixture model approach is the Dirichlet process, or well, I'll be probably saying DP for short quite a bit. Um, and the structure of a Dirichlet process model is basically that species that are in the same group or cluster have the same parameters. So that's the same as what we saw before. Um, we model group or cluster level parameters, which I'll denote as beta sub G. So the sub G means that we're now talking about group or cluster level parameters. They are modeled as com coming from some distribution um, that's denoted with G naught, which is also called the base distribution. So we have cluster level parameters coming from a base distribution. 
And then we can look at species level parameters, which will be indicated with uh, the little uh, star or asterisk. So, um, and the subscript will be I for species. So those are species level parameters. They can then be modeled as following a Dirichlet process with a base distribution and a parameter alpha that is also called the concentration parameter that effectively governs how many uh, groups the community splits into. And then we of course still have to estimate um, species group membership. And the, the big question then is, well, how do we estimate um, these um, group membership probabilities? So the probabilities that a species falls within a particular group. And that is, of course, related to alpha because alpha governed, governs how many groups there are in the first place. And while there are multiple ways that you can um, implement the Dirichlet process uh, in order to estimate these group membership probabilities, the one that we chose um, is called the stick breaking algorithm. Personally, I found that to be the most intuitive um, of the options that I saw. It's also convenient because you can actually implement it in software like JAGS. And so in the stick breaking algorithm, again, what you're trying to do is estimate these um, group membership probabilities. You create an auxiliary variable new, which um, you seem to follow a beta distribution where that concentration parameter constitutes one of the shape parameters of the beta distribution. So now you can uh, generate, um, uh, well, as you know, a, a beta random variable is a proportion. So you can now generate that first uh, value for new, and that constitutes the probability for group membership for your first group. And you can think of that as a proportion you break off a stick, hence the stick breaking algorithm. So um, let's see here, imagine, so I just have a little um, example. Um, down here. So you would have a stick, you would um, generate your first proportion and think of it as breaking that proportion of the stick. Then you could generate uh, the second random variable, which is considered the proportion of the remaining stick. So, uh, right, so now you break off a proportion of the remaining stick, which you can then uh, simply convert back to what proportion of the original stick that would be. And you do that um, basically. Um, an infinite number of times, so to speak, um, to obtain your estimates of a group membership probability um, in this fashion. Now, if you're wondering how you do that an infinite number of times, you, of course, there is a, a, a practical limit. But basically, if you have a community of 50 species, you can't have more than 50 um, um, clusters or groups. Um, so there is, it's not really an infinite process in that sense. And so what you can also see then from this basic algorithm is that if alpha is large, then the proportions that are broken off are small. And so we end up with a large number of groups. And if um, alpha is small, the proportions that are broken off are large and we end up with a low number of groups. So we can, um, and that's what we did in, um, in a recent paper. Um, that we've published, you can combine this uh, Dirichlet process with a community occupancy model by using the Dirichlet process as um, that hyper distribution that is shared by um, the community. So we have again the same um, detection and um, ecological state processes here. Then we have modeling of the parameters of these processes using, in this case, a probit link function as a function of um, um, covariates. Now, um, I have sort of subsumed the intercepts into um, the vectors of, co of uh, regression coefficients here. So the intercept is just sort of hidden in here. And then you can model these uh, vectors of um, coefficients following this Dirichlet process with a base distribution and some concentration parameter, as I just laid out. And for uh, um, the base distribution, we chose a multivariate normal distribution with some mean and some variance covariance matrix. And of course, um, so here we, in this uh, slide, I've specified a different Dirichlet process for each component of the model. I think that's reasonable because you would probably not necessarily assume species to be similar in terms of the ecological process and at the same time be similar in terms of the detection process. But you could, of course, change that around. You could just have a Dirichlet process um, hyper, uh, hyper distribution on one of these uh, model levels. So. Um, this isn't like the one and only um, version of this particular model. So let's take a step back from all these formulas and think about what we're actually trying to achieve with such a model. 
um, typical um, quantities of interest in um, community occupancy modeling are to calculate the extent of species occurrence um, over, um, so over the sampling locations, how many are occupied by a species, and also to understand how occurrence and possibly detection are affected by covariates. So we have these coefficient vectors, and those are standard quantities of interest in community occupancy modeling. Um, the Dirichlet process um, model now also allows us to look into how many groups our community breaks up into. So it tells us something about community structure. And we can derive from um, results from this model how similar species are with respect to um, parameters by looking at how likely two species are to be in the same clusters. And so now these are new quantities of interest from the um, Dirichlet process community model that you can't directly estimate with a regular um, normal community model. So the first step, of course, with a new uh, modeling approach is to validate or evaluate how your model actually works. And we did that by implementing a simulation study. The main questions, um, so there's lots of nuances what, to this particular simulation, but I want to focus sort of on the main questions, which were, well, how well does the DPCOM estimate standard and new quantities of interest? Um, and we looked at that along two gradients. One gradient was the degree of distinctiveness in parameters among clusters, um, which um, I'm fudging a little bit, but we express that degree of distinctiveness with a single parameter, omega. And um, hopefully that's intuitive. Um, the reasoning behind that is that um, the more distinct groups are, the easier it should be to assign species to their respective groups and the better the model should do um, in estimating this group structure and species similarity. The second gradient we looked at was uh, the number of parameters that make up the multivariate normal base distribution. Um, that's denoted with M. And the reason we looked at that is, um, for one, if you um, if species are grouped based on more parameters um, in more dimensions, again, there's more information available to group species. Uh, and then once you get into really high dimensional clustering, it's actually um, the opposite becomes a problem where if you have too many dimensions, you end up with really sparse data and data points always look very different. So clearly the number of dimensions are important in um, clustering algorithms. And so even though we're not working in really high dimensional space here, we wanted to look at how this dimensionality or the number of parameters making up the multivariate normal base distribution plays into how well um, the model performs. And then we also wanted to compare the performance of our new model against the performance of a regular community occupancy model when applied to a clustered community. So in other words, we, for, uh, we simulated communities um, and um, under a, a clustered model and then uh, looked at how well does the normal regular community model perform even applied to a clustered community. Our simulation had sort of three main steps. First, we simulated our community data. We had 30 species that were grouped into five clusters um, uh, distributed across 35 sites. We only used a Dirichlet process um, hyperdistribution uh, on parameters of the occupancy process. And we looked at scenarios where the number of parameters in the DP were ranged from one, so an intercept only model for occupancy, to five, so an intercept and four covariates in the occupancy component. Um, and in terms of distinctiveness, we explored three scenarios with omega ranging from one being the least distinct scenario to two or to five, and five obviously being the most distinct. We held detection probability constant for all species and all occasions and across space. Um, that was just to simplify things a little bit and because these models are fairly time intensive to run, so we um, also had to try and limit um, adding more time to them. And we simulated five visits to each site to generate these repeated detection on detection data. We then um, fit both the Dirichlet process community model and the regular community model to these generated data and then compared estimates uh, on several levels. So for the standard quantities, the number of sites occupied and the drivers of species occurrence or predictors of species occurrence, we compared those estimates both to truths, so to data generating values, and also between the two modeling approaches. And then for these quantities that only the Dirichlet process model can estimate, so the number of clusters and how similar species are, we compared those only to truth, obviously. We had 50 iterations per scenario, again, very limited number because these models take so darn long to run. Um, here are our scenarios again. 
defined in terms of the number of parameters or the number of dimensions and the distinctiveness of clusters. We fit those models in a Bayesian framework in JAGS, and we kind of expect, as I've laid out before, we expect the Dishley process model to do better the more distinct clusters are and the more parameters there are um, in, or the, the higher the dimensionality is, the more parameters there are in the multivariate normal um, base distribution. So with all of that, I'm going to show you again some key um, results from that simulation study, starting out with estimating the number of clusters. So in all of these plots, uh, you'll see these panels that correspond to the different um, scenarios. We have omega, so the level of distinctiveness in the columns, and we have the number of parameters um, or dimensionality in the rows. In red, you have truths, so the, simula the data simulating value was five clusters. Um, these are violin plots over all 50 iterations for a given scenario, showing um, the median over these um, iterations. So the first thing you can see is that when clusters are fairly similar, um, it's almost impossible to estimate any number of clusters. Pretty much the model mostly estimated everybody to be in one cluster. And that was also the case with omega equal two, but when we just had an intercept only model. But when we look at those scenarios where um, there seems to have been some information on species clustering um, in the data or the model has been able to extract those, then we do see that as expected, um, the number of the estimates of number of clusters improves as we add more parameters and as um, clusters become more distinct but even though they improve so if we think about this sort of as our best case scenario there's still a pretty consistent um, positive bias in the estimates of the number of clusters so uh, this in, in this case i think it was an estimate of k equals seven um, we can look at estimating species similarity. Um, now, as I said, so how do we calculate species similarity? We looked at the number of MCMC iterations or the proportion of MCMC iterations in which two species were uh, in the same cluster. Um, and then we compared that um, to whether they were truly in the same cluster on, in the data generation, or uh, and that would give us the true clustering rate, or uh, we looked at um, species pairs that in truth were not in the same cluster to obtain the false clustering rate. And then again, here you see the average over these 50 iterations for our different scenarios. And what you can see again, when clusters are very similar, the model pretty much gets it wrong as often as it gets it right in terms of whether two species are in the same cluster, which is not at all surprising because it also estimated that there is just one cluster. So um, that's obviously consistent with what we saw on the previous panel. What you can see in the other um, scenarios though is again, as expected, the estimates or getting it right in terms of two species being the same cluster gets better with increase in M and with increase in omega. What's interesting though is that it's not so much the correct clustering rate that goes up a ton, but it is the false clustering rate. So putting two species in the same cluster when in fact they should be different that keeps going down. So then we can look at the more standard quantities from community occupancy models, looking at the number of sites occupied. Um, here in orange, you have results uh, for the Dirichlet process model in blue for the normal um, model. Um, displayed is the average, uh, or sorry, relative bias in um, N. And what you can see is that both approaches return on average unbiased estimates of a number of sites occupied. And the one model doesn't really seem to be any better than the other, also in terms of sort of extreme cases of bias. Oh, I should also say these are now averages not just over the 50 iterations, but also all the species in the community. Um, and then here still for N, looking at the coefficient of variation, um, again, we see that um, both models are similarly precise in their estimates of the um, of the number of sites occupied and the CVs, the median CVs ranged from nine to 15% across these different scenarios. So doing pretty well here. Then we can look at the other quantity of interest, those species specific coefficients um, on occupancy probability. Um, and again, same sort of setup, DP model in orange, normal model in blue, and first looking at bias. Um, this is, of course, just one of the um, regression coefficients. Um, there are a bunch, and this is just to sort of illustrate what results look like for this group of parameters. Um, 
we can see that again both models tend to be uh, unbiased or have some low bias in these scenarios over here um, but we also see that um, you know these uh, incidences so species or iteration specific incidences of high bias tend to increase as we have more distinctive clusters and as we have more um, more parameters in our multivariate normal I'm not showing you a plot here, but um, just telling you that both models also were similarly precise. So we also looked at coefficients of variation for these parameters. Um, we did so for this pattern of you know the incidence of species-specific bias increasing. We weren't really expecting that, um, so we tried to look into that a little bit. Uh, what we found was that it was usually that it was always the same data sets that led to high bias under either modeling approach. Um, and so that suggests that there's something in the data structure um, and not so much in the modeling approach that um, affects the bias that we see. Um, and we couldn't really figure out what that was in the data structure. We looked at very basic things like, is it sort of the total quantity of data, the total number of detections, but we couldn't really see any patterns here. So I don't really have a good explanation for um, these patterns. So the take home message from all these plots um, is that um, much to our dismay, the Dirichlet process community model did not improve estimates of standard quantities of interest. So um, uh, extent of occurrence and what drives occurrence, even when um, fit to clustered communities. And um, that's important to consider because the, the DPCOM was harder to fit in the sense that we had several convergence issues. Um, it takes much longer to run, um, like on the order of days, where the um, when you have a reasonable sized data set, the, or the running time is the, on the order of days, whereas for the regular model, it's uh, more in terms of hours. And so we recommend that if you're uh, interested in these main quantity, in these typical quantities, um, then you're better off just using the normal community occupancy model. Um, especially because that performed just as well even when fit to a clustered communities. Um, now that said, those results probably depend on several things we didn't explore, such as sample size, community size, number of clusters, or sort of the ratio of community size to number of clusters, the size of clusters, and so forth. So there are so many dimensions here that we didn't have an opportunity to explore that may affect um, these, uh, these patterns. We did, however, find that the uh, DPCOM could recuperate some information on community structure and species similarities. I mean, we, we found this sort of persistent bias in the number of clusters, which was, again, kind of surprising for us because in a previous study by, uh, by Johnson and Sinclair, who used um, this approach in combination with a, with a community abundance model, not a community occupancy model, they found no bias in, in K. Um, so again, we don't really have a great explanation for that, other than that what we're trying to do here is um, determine clusters based on a partially latent and binary state variable. So that may just make it a lot harder um, for the model to um, figure out who clusters with whom. And in spite of this bias, that um, there was clearly some information in the pairwise species similarities. Um, those were estimated reasonably well. And so um, the, this model does then allow us to address some novel questions about potential correlates of these species similarities. So for example, um, taxonomic, functional, or in terms of conservation status. And to illustrate that, we included a quick application um, in this particular paper as well, where we fit the uh, DPCOM2 uh, data set now finally come the birds, to a community of 166 species of birds. The data were collected in uh, Murchison Falls National Park in Uganda. Um, whoops, sorry, I went the wrong way. Here we go. Um, the birds were surveyed in 2010, over 149 locations, repeatedly. Um, and for each location, we also had information on the distance of that location from an oil well, as well as on habitat type, which was binary, either sort of open savanna habitat or more closed woodland habitat. And we used those as species, uh, as predictors of occupancy probability with species specific coefficients. We also um, had information on observer experience uh, that was either intermediate or high, which we also used as a predictor on detection probability, but as a fixed predictor. So fixed across all species, because we figured if an observer is good for one species, um, he or she would probably be good for all species of birds. And also, again, with uh, an eye on 
keeping a simple model structure because these models take so long to fit. We use the DP structure for, occupant, for the occupancy component only. So we have uh, an intercept and two predictors. So three um, parameters in terms of dimensions of the multivariate normal base distribution. Because we, all, we found in the simulations that the model does so poorly when you only have one parameter, um, we didn't bother fitting the DP structure to the, um, the detection component, which basically just has a species specific intercept. And so what we're looking at here then is how similar species are with respect to their response in occurrence to oil wells and habitat. And I'm just going to focus on those similarity estimates rather than also looking at the species specific um, um, coefficients. So the first thing you can do, um, which looks really nice, so that's always fun to do, is you can make sort of a heat map that shows you how similar species are. So both on the x-axis and y-axis, you have species identity not shown because there's just too many of them. And then the color range shows you the, the similarity. Um, and in this case, um, our species were estimated to group into 27 clusters. So that's um, out of 166 species down to 27 clusters. That's um, a pretty strong clustering right there. And we had similarity scores, pairwise similarity ranging from zero to 0.92. So there were definitely species in there that were almost always in the same cluster. And there were species in there that were never in the same cluster. And you can see that of course here where you have sort of these, um, these areas where um, um, clustering similarity, um, it gets really high. Um, but to take it one step further and illustrate how that could actually be useful to address ecological questions, we then um, took the 10 most species families in, um, in our community. And for each family, we calculate the average pairwise similarity of all species in that family. We then contrast that average to the average across the entire community with um, against the background that there are sort of two theories of um, how um, taxonomically similar species um, should be different or more similar in terms of their um, ecological requirements. So um, one theory goes that closely um, related species should be um, more similar morphologically and therefore also perhaps more similar in their requirements, um, which we'll refer to as niche conservatism. There's other um, studies arguing and showing that closely related species that are also like St. Patrick should should have um, neat niche differentiation so they can actually occur sympatrically. And so um, when we looked at these uh, average pairwise similarity scores of our 10 families, let me orient you here. So we have the families on the x-axis, we have the similarity scores on the y-axis. The black line is the average of the community. The gray band is the, um, the fifth and 90th um, percentile for um, the community average. Um, the dots are the um, averages for each family, and the whiskers are again the fifth and 90th percentile in pairwise similarity for these families. What you can see then is that most families are really pretty similar to the overall community average. Ha, I forgot one. The red line is what we would expect if um, we just completely randomly grouped species together. So at complete randomness, we have like a really, really low uh, average similarity score. So, okay, so most families are pretty similar to the overall community. The only one that really stands out are the sunbirds, which have considerably higher um, similarity. And so might be considered as an example for niche conservatism, of course, only related to those parameters that are in our model. So distance to oil well and habitat, which um, uh, just in case you're wondering, they like to be further away from oil wells and they liked the woody habitat. All right, um, with that, I move to the um, second case study that I wanted to show you, um, where rather than changing or expanding the um, basic occupancy model, we used occupancy modeling output in order to construct diversity profiles to capture biodiversity complexities. Um, and that part of the talk will be a little bit shorter. Um, so, so far I've been talking about drivers of species level occupancy, but as I've said initially, community occupancy models are also being used to generate measures of community diversity, particularly richness. And so you can think about calculating from, from the output both site level richness, which is just the sum of all of these um, occurrence states for all species at a given site, or you could uh, scale that up and look at area level richness where you basically just sum how many species occur at all in the area of interest. 
And this area level richness, just briefly mentioned, is of course typically estimated in combination with data augmentation, where the number, sort of the dimensions of your data are larger than the number of observed species. They're padded with what's called like these all zero encounter histories, where you're trying to estimate whether there were species there that you completely missed. Um, but richness is of course only one measure of diversity, um, and there are many other indices um, that people use to um, quantify diversity and these other indices contrary to richness incorporate evenness so how much a community is domi dominated by few um, species or rather evenness being the opposite you know not being dominated um, by species um, and often when people look at different uh, diversity indices they may indicate different patterns in diversity and so against that background in the 70s, um, the concept of hill numbers was developed that looks at diversity along a continuous gradient, which is uh, denoted with Q. And that gradient um, quantifies how much we weigh rare species. Um, and when you plot hill numbers against that gradient, then what you get is essentially a diversity profile. And they look like this. So here you have Q, that gradient on the X axis, you have a measure of diversity on the Y axis where um, Q equals zero, all species are weighed equal, equally no matter um, how abundant they are. And so then you have, of course, richness. And as you move along the X axis, um, you move more towards questions of evenness where rare species contribute less to the community. And along those, um, along those um, profiles, you find um, relatives of the typical um, uh, the typical diversity indices. So this is the um, exponential of Shannon's entropy. And at Q equal two, you have um, the inverse Simpson's concentration index. And just for a completeness, here's the formula to calculate a diversity um, based um, for each level of Q. And um, don't worry too much about that format. What I just want to point out is what goes into that formula is relative abundance. So if lambda is abundance of a species, um, you can see that um, this is just the relative abundance of the species in the community that goes into that formula for calculating diversity. So these indices other than richness are based on relative abundance, um, but um, abundance can be really challenging to estimate for an entire community, especially when you wanna do it right uh, and account for imperfect and varying detection. And again, especially if you're dealing with species that are hard to detect to begin with. And um, because of that, these um, profiles have recently been adopted to incidence data. So that's just occurrence data, ignoring imperfect detection or um, assuming perfect detection, and as well as to detection corrected estimates of occupancy. And we wanted to build on this, particularly this uh, recent development to look at how well occupancy-based diversity profiles represent true abundance-based profiles. This is a paper that is uh, not quite out yet, that's um, in revision. Um, we have a couple of expectations. Um, first off, we don't expect those to um, you know, match abundance-based diversity profiles one-on-one, -on -one, um, of course, because we're looking at different quantities. But more specifically, we expect um, that diversity is overestimated for Q larger zero because of that asymptotic relationship between abundance and occurrence. So basically, when you reduce abundances down to occurrence, you basically artificially increase the evenness of the community. So that's why we expect diversity to be overestimated. Um, as soon as we take into account relative abundance of species. We also expect um, uh, richness to be overestimated because if, um, by implementing data augmentation, we basically um, create these non-zero probabilities of presence for augmented species, even if those are really low. Um, it's basically enough if the species is present at one of the sites in our, in our um, area to be counted. And so that's why we expect um, richness also to be overestimated. As sort of a side question that I may not get to, um, we asked whether we can reduce that positive bias using thresholds, but I may skip that, um, we'll see. And um, we do expect that in spite of these biases that the approach, so using occupancy-based diversity profiles should still be able to order study areas correctly by their diversity and therefore you know, talk about sort of relative patterns and diversity. We used, again, the simulation approach to look into that. Basically, we uh, generated five landscapes and we um, looked at that sort of in the context of how disturbance uh, and diversity um, are related. But of course, you could, you know, that's just the context we chose. It's not really crucial, but we have basically an undisturbed landscape where we have highest diversity all the way down to a very disturbed landscape. For each of these five landscapes or areas, we simulated abundances, 
we, that we modeled as being affected by um, disturbance for a maximum of 40 species. Each of these landscapes was divided into 50 by 50 cells. And so we um, generated abundance on the cell area, uh, on the cell level. The resulting uh, richnesses ranged from 40 species in these undisturbed landscapes to on average 17 species in this very disturbed landscape. We then uh, generated or we generated that um, detection data at 100 sampling points per area. Uh, so again, repeated detection data to get these data that are suitable for occupancy modeling. Analyzed these data with community occupancy models and then calculated diversity profiles from the output. Now, just to um, be clear, since that's sort of the key to what um, we're doing. So um, what we're doing here is that we take our community occupancy model, ignoring the specific hyper distributions for the time being. The key is that the, they allow us to estimate these uh, occupancy probabilities for each species at each sampling location. And we use those in that formula to calculate diversity. Basically, we have them replace um, the, the abundance or the relative abundance. So instead of relative abundance, we now have relative prevalence um, in this formula. So I put the red circle, unfortunately, uh, directly over that bar, but there's a bar over this uh, psi over here, and that is basically the average occupancy probability for a given species over all sample location, locations. So we have just adjusted this formula to relative prevalence based on what um, people had done previously. So we repeated this process 100 times, and then we um, plotted um, the profiles and to have uh, quantitative comparisons, we um, compared estimates of richness uh, and those two other indices that fall along the profile against the abundance-based truth for these values. And we also compared the ordering of areas with respect to these three indices to the ordering of or the true ordering um, based on abundance-based um, calculations for these uh, parameters. So here are <clears throat> some results. Uh, on the left, you see the uh, true abundance-based diversity profiles. The colored lines um, are the averages and the gray um, um, polygons are the, um, the, I think they're the standard deviations over the 100 um, iterations just because otherwise they all just blend together. But what you see is basically the two undisturbed areas have much higher richness and maintain higher diversity. The more disturbed areas are down here. And these two particularly, those two intermediate ones are really very similar in diversity. And then here on the right hand side, we have estimated occupancy based diversity profiles. Um, and you can see that all our expectations come true. Um, there is a consistent positive bias, bias and estimates of diversity um, as we expected. Um, uh, for Q larger zero, if you look at Q equal to zero, we said we would also expect positive bias. We don't see any positive bias for those under, more undisturbed areas. That's because we capped our data augmentation at 40. So there is no nowhere to go uh, above 40. So they couldn't really be positively biased. But for these other areas, we see positive bias um, in the richness estimates under occupancy-based profiles as well. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to um, skip the threshold thing um, and go straight to the second main question, whether uh, occupancy-based profiles lead to the correct ordering um, of areas in terms of species diversity. Here for the three indices, you see that the number of iterations where the order of areas was returned correctly by, by occupancy-based uh, diversity profiles is really high. Um, where those uh, sometimes where those profiles sometimes didn't get it right was for these um, two intermediate disturbed areas that were very similar to begin with. So they um, they do pretty well uh, in terms of um, returning the same order of areas as expected. Um, so that is promising because um, species detection data is a lot easier to collect for an entire community of species than data that allow detection corrected estimation of abundance. Um, and our results do um, support the notion that these occupancy-based diversity profiles hold promise to study diversity patterns um, while accounting for imperfect and varying detection probability. And um, these can um, actually um, be extended to account for species similarity as well. So any sort, sort of um, dimension of species similarity you're interested in, that has been um, developed um, also in a previous paper, but I just want to briefly show you what that looks like. So here's again that formula for um, 
calculating diversity. Now this term has changed a little bit. The second relative abundance term is now calculated, taking into account a, um, a species similarity matrix, which if, if that's just uh, the identity matrix, then it returns um, it um, returns back to the uh, the form of the formula you saw before. But it basically, we can now incorporate how similar species are in our calculations of diversity and get what um, what's referred to as like the effective number of species if they were all uh, absolutely different from each other. So just very briefly, we applied this to, again, a BERT data set, this time from Borneo, 165 species sampled across 307 locations in four habitat types, continuous forest, riparian forest, riparian forest fragments and oil palm plantations, and then just riparian zones that had no more forest and were also in oil palm plantations. And here are um, this first plot here is just the regular um, or species uh, diversity based profiles. You can see that the ordering is as expected, continuous forest and riparian forest having the highest diversity. Um, what's interesting, once you account for similarity, when you do that uh, taxonomically, the ordering um, or the patterns remains pretty similar. But once you look at phylogenetic and dietary similarity, what's interesting to see is that even though we lose species in these more disturbed landscapes, the phylogenetic makeup of the community, um, relative phylogenetic makeup of the community, as well as the relative makeup in terms of dietary um, preferences remains the same. And so again, this allows you, to, allows you to start asking questions about, you know, whether there's filtering going on as species disappear from communities, which doesn't seem to be the case, again, along those two axes in our um, example. And because I am out of time, wanna give you a few moments to ask questions as well. I'm gonna skip the second um, application example that wasn't on birds, but on amphibians, and just conclude that hopefully I was able to show you that um, Community occupancy models can be extended and applied in multitude of ways pr to provide insight into species and community ecology. And that's um, really promising because they're increasingly popular owing to the relative ease with which data can be collected and that they can be applied to so many data collection protocols from direct observations to you know, novel E and I DNA collect data collection to just indirect science surveys. So with that, I think a multitude of people that were involved in these different studies that I showed you, plus the study that I didn't get to show you. And I thank you for listening and am happy to um, try and answer any questions. All right, thank you, Rahel. Um, so at this time, uh, we'll do uh, the Q&A. So you can either use the hand raise feature and we can unmute you so, so you can ask your question or you can drop a question in the in the chat and we'll direct it to uh, Dr. Salman. So um, usually takes a second for people to... No rush, I'm happy to catch my breath for a moment. <laughs> So I guess while we're waiting, like what is what is uh, in that picture there? Uh, There's the um, uh, jack jackrabbit ears. Um, yeah, not not at all birdy. Um. Yeah, it didn't didn't look too much like a bird. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a question from uh, for Eli Holmes. Uh, it's a hand raised. Uh, Eli, you should be able to unmute yourself. I, um, yeah, great talk. There's really, really interesting stuff. Um, I, I work on uh, hidden state space models, different contexts, different kind of data, continuous data. So I'm not very familiar with these um, models. And I'm wondering, like, um, in the community uh, occupancy models, how do you account for, or do people account for, like, differences in the um, say kind of like the patch size in which the observation occurs. So I guess what I'm thinking is that um, the uh, habitat, size of the habitat um, in which you observe species would have um, a bit strong effect on whether you see two yeah. species, right? Just because like the number of individuals that could be in that patch. Yes, 
Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, so that's that's a great question. That's um, really um, a general question, or that applies generally to occupancy modeling in all its ways, shapes, and forms. And it um, what, how relevant it is, I think, really depends on what particular data collection method you apply and how um, how your um, larger area of interest is structured. So um, originally, uh, they were um, developed with these sort of discrete patches that I think you're referring to um, in mind, where you would definitely want to take into account that patch size um, should affect um, you know how likely a species is to occur. Um, in that case, you could um, just include that as a predictor um, on your occupancy probability. Um, in other cases, so for example, for the, the the typical bird data collection protocol is just sort of a fixed radius point count, and so you just assume that you're surveying the same sized area at every site where you're, you're um, collecting data on birds, for example, um, because you just, you know, just sort of take note of observations that happen within, say, a 100 meter radius. Um, and so that's how um, people tend to um, um, homogenize and get rid of that problem of, you know, patch size um, and its effect on occurrence probability. And then you know how it applies to other data collection protocols. So for camera traps, which is like a point-based sampling method, um, people will typically assume that you know it surveys a particular area. Um, it gets a little more fuzzy though because you know you don't really have that much control or or any control over you know from which area animals come and happen to pass in front of a camera trap. So yeah, people do account for it. Um, how much it's an issue depends on the particular data collection protocol. Did that answer your question? Um, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, no, which is, sounds like they, you can include it as a as a covariate. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll let others go. I have a, a another question, but I will wait. There does not. There isn't currently a a line so Eli you can ask the next question if you want. Okay um, so this is kind of related um, and that is um, how much consistency is there in the results of this across different survey areas and so this is kind of related because in my mind I'm imagining if you went out and your survey area was a, a fairly undisturbed forest versus if you went and did the same kind of surveys in a more patchy habitat. Um, and so this is kind of related because it's I, in my mind, I'm thinking about, well, in one case you have this really big patch and all the species could be there and the other one, it's, it's a little broken up and it's just not possible to observe them. But I mean, just in general, like how consistent are these, are the results across different habitats? different survey areas yeah so um i don't know that there's um a general answer to that um i would say that um you know depending on how you set up your study again you could um you could take these differences in sort of landscape scale um habitat composition um into account by again um including them as covariates or including proxies for, to, for that as covariates. So I'm thinking, you know, if you have two study areas and even though you only sample in forest in one of your study areas, that forest is patchy because the overall area has been disturbed, whereas in the other area, your forest is continuous, um, then you could, um, you know, just um, include, you know, study area as a, a predictor, sort of a proxy that you would then assume would be a proxy for that overall landscape scale disturbance um, level. Um, but yeah, I don't know that there is a um, that there is a generalizable answer to how um, consistent these results are. I'm, at least I'm not aware that anybody has really tried to quantify that. It looks like we have a question from Beth Gardner. Beth, you should be able to unmute. Hey, Rahel, nice talk. Hey, Beth. Uh, so. I'm curious if you have any idea if the 
different ways that you can do the zero site process would affect your results. So use the like broken stick approach, but would other ways possibly result in better inference? I actually have no uh, feeling or intuition about that, I have to be honest, um, because this is the first and so far only time that I've worked with this approach at all. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess it's I, I guess it's possible that um, a different um, parameterization of the um, dish lay process would lead to um, better results. But I, yeah, I, unfortunately, I have no no intuition or knowledge to answer that question. Yeah, I, I have no idea either. I was <laughs> curious. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> There is a question in the in the chat, um, which I'm happy to read out, unless there's some other raised hands. Oh, certainly, go for it. Okay, so let's see. I haven't even read it myself yet, so we'll see. With the Dirichlet process model, to what extent is identification of K sensitive to covariate choice? I can imagine that poor choice of covariates could falsely suggest greater similarity across uh, among species. So yeah, I think um, that um, that I agree with that in the sense that um, you're doing the clustering based on the similarity of species in their response to these covariates. So if you choose covariates, say, that aren't really meaningful to these species, or let's say there's covariate where every species truly is different from everybody else, then they're not really going to help you with estimating species similarity or the number of clusters. Um, I could also imagine that if you have uh, sort of um, confounding covariates to which maybe most or all species or some species in your um, in your um, community respond similarly, even though that's um, that you could sort of um, overestimate similarity as well. I, I would be more concerned with just not uh, choosing covariates that don't really provide much information on species similarity. But yeah, because because that's what the clustering is based on, I think it definitely has an influence on how you estimate, how well you estimate K. Okay. Well, thank you, Rahel. Uh, we are at our time, so uh, I'm gonna end it here. But um, if folks have, if folks want to stick around for a couple minutes to chat, uh, you can stick around for a couple minutes. Rahel has agreed to, to stick around. Um, so thank you. And uh, any, uh, next week, folks, as a reminder, we'll have uh, Dr. Chrissy Hernandez from Cornell, who will be talking to us about something very different, uh, tuna larva, <laughs> individual-based modeling of tuna larva. <laughs> so see you all next time. Yeah, thank you all.